Good morning. John chapter 10 this morning. And the date is November. Is it seven? Seven. Number seven? Yeah, number, number seven. seven. And we're going to start chapter 10, a couple of more of the I Am's of Christ. Um, actually, we got into this a little bit and read uh, this chapter. We're going, to do it. we're going to read it again. But um, as, uh, as I usually like to do, well, we're going to start with a, a video this morning, which is a testimony and then we'll get into the word. But let's open with prayer together. Father, we're grateful today, Lord, that we have um, the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord, in our life, that we are um, alive today because of him who is alive, who uh, was, who is, who is to come, who uh, was dead and is alive again. And because of him, Lord, we have life. We, were, we who were dead spiritually are now made alive together with him. And we have this new life in Christ that we can expect that we're not the same, that we can live differently of this world uh, as overcomers to, to this world. Because Jesus, you overcame sin. You overcame my sin, my addiction to it, my, in, my enslavement to it. As well as um, my, as well as its penalty, and uh, my condemnation to it, we're grateful that you you live, and we have our life that is hidden with Christ in God, and we want that which is hidden as a reality with God to become made a reality in the natural in the world that you the world will see the kingdom of God in uh, truth as it's lived out and seen in the people of God in our lives today. So we commit the day to you, we commit ourselves to you, we're your people, have your way and fill your temple today. Fill us with your spirit and with your presence. Let the words that come out of our mouths honor you, praise you, give you glory, and just declare exactly who you are by the things you've done and are doing in our lives, as well as, uh, Lord, the revelation of who you are and of what you declare about yourself because in your light we see light so let there be nothing in our hearts except your light and in our minds let them be transformed by the renewing of our minds by your power today lord may we see you as you are may we see jesus more clearly and more fully lord in exactly all that you are not st stress or fret about what we think you want to do in our lives but we'll just leave that to you. May we just fix our eyes on you, the one who's the author and the finisher and the perfecter of our faith. Draw us to him. May, may we make much of Jesus today that we will then see and know the Father and all of the intimacy that you desire us to have. Draw us to you today and quicken your words to our heart today. And may we remember that it is you that drew us to yourself changed us and brought us from death unto life and uh, may we be encouraged and strengthened and stirred up lord stirring one another up to love and to good works to christ and uh, to one another this day in jesus name amen amen i'm going to show i want to open up today with a, a testimony of a young lady who um, who went from uh, in a very quick, in a very quick, in a, I'd say, a 30-second version of it. She went from uh, growing up in a Christian, or maybe, or perhaps maybe it was a pseudo-Christian home, a Christianized home, uh, where uh, she actually was abused uh, sexually by the minister in the church, and it, she grew up to be to become full of hate, full of anger. Uh, for, you know, as a child, she uh, a thought that she deserved um, her her punishment and her lot in life is what, what you would as a child. When the adults you trust uh, treat you in a certain way, you just expect it. But then, as you get older and, and the teen years and and, the, and beyond, you're angry. You're angry at uh, not only what was done to you, but what was kept from you. The love, the true love that was. Uh, 
you were deprived of, um, and that's, I understood it. And then she gets to the point of committing suicide, and that's when God steps in. This testimony I actually shared uh, in a sermon about four years ago here at the net. And uh, so some of you might remember it. And uh, it fits in well with uh, uh, what we're studying and, and what Jesus does in our life. It also fits in well with the, ser the sermon series that uh, we're doing now with from, uh, orphans to heirs. Uh, because you'll never know God until you know him as Father. And when you don't have a God that you can come to as Father, you're, cha you're, you're, you're running away from him who you know is going to be your ultimate judge. And when you hate him, you know that it's not going to be a good meeting because you have nothing but animosity to spill out over towards him. But God's big enough to take that because his heart is to want to know us. So those, if you're watching on the video, um, you can pause your video here and move over to the link. The link is, um, is uh, an atheist turns to God, the story of Shelley Hung, Hungley. And actually, I think this story might have been uh, aired on CBN on the 700 Club some years ago. So uh, we're going to take a pause here. We're going to go to that. <clears throat> yeah, so that testimony is a... Uh, that's what we're saving. I, I, that's a blessing to me. And I said, uh, I, every time I see that, it brings tears to my eyes. It brings me back to the moment I... I I had the same thing. You're going to have to show me that you're here right now, not from somebody else, because I don't trust anybody else. I don't believe there's love in any other human being that's going to change me. It's like nothing but the opposite experience with that. And, uh, and he did that. And I finally cried out to him at the end of my, at the night, I thought about I was going to take my life. And he showed himself to me in the middle of a night. Um, a big open field out in the middle of the night. He was there, and I felt the weight of 500 pounds being lifted off my back. I saw, as it were, in, in a, a spiritual vision, Jesus with his arms outstretched, not in a position of dying, but of one, almost like one who was on the cross, but now is alive, and he's calling me to come. And he's real. And that same thing, but with the way she described it, when he came in, I didn't just, I wasn't, I wasn't burst out and overflowing with tongue speaking and all these big evidences. It, it was a quiet, still, small spring of hope, like a, 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 like a look, like hope was there, and, and and that's and 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 that's all I needed to get that, that from that is going to come all. All the rest of my life is going to come and flow out of that. And that's, what, that's why Jesus came, that we would have relationship with God as Father, Father of lights. And that's what he's really, the explanation of what he's trying to get through to the Pharisees now, after chapter 9 and the healing of the blind man, and I am the light of the world, chapter 8, now chapter 10, the shepherd of the sheep, and I have a, a and, 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 and he takes it from the sword because I come from the Father. But you don't understand what I have, what I'm saying, you don't believe what I'm saying because you, Jewish people, are not of the Father. Yes, you, you claim Abraham is your father, but you're not, you're not related to the God that Abraham believed in as Father. He's not your father. You're of your father, the devil. And that's why you not only don't understand what I'm saying, but you want to snuff out what I'm saying. You want to kill me. Because that takes, that, that itself, that position that you're taking against light and truth it is itself an agenda that's evil. Darkness doesn't like the light. And so it resists it. And he's making it, 
he's making that he's make he's drawn this line in the sand between um, what is God's and what is not God's, and those who are God's are people who know Him. So let's go through and read chapter ten one more time. We're going to talk about pull some of the stuff out of, out of this chapter and look at. The way Jesus describes what he came for and what he came to do and to accomplish is to bring the fatherhood of God back to men and bring men back into relationship with God as father, which religion couldn't do, self uh, efforts uh, of, uh, of uh, men's good works can't accomplish, and all the amount of willpower that you had could not accomplish the law therefore fails to do what only God can do. John chapter 10. <clears throat> okay. I tell you the truth. The man who does not enter the sheep pen by the gate but climbs in by some other way is a thief and a robber. The man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought them all, uh, brought out all of his own, he goes on ahead of them and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. But they will never follow a stranger. In fact, they will they will run away from him because they don't recognize the stranger's voice. Jesus used this figure of speech, but they did not understand what he was telling them. Therefore, Jesus said again, I tell you the truth, I am the gate for the sheep. All of you who ever came before me were thieves and robbers but the sheep didn't listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. He will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal, kill, destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it to the fullest. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and he cares nothing for the sheep. I am a good shepherd, the good shepherd. I know my sheep, and my sheep know me. Just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. The reason my Father loves me is that I lay down my life only to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. This command I received from my father. At these words, the Jews were again divided. Many of them said, he's demon possessed and raving man. Why listen to him? But others said, these aren't the sayings of a man possessed by a demon. Can a demon open the eyes of a blind man? Okay, let's have somebody finish this. 22 to 42. Um, the last 20 verses. Who can read nice and loud today? Okay. Then came the Feast of Dedication at Jerusalem. It was winter, and Jesus was in the temple area walking in Solomon's colonnade. The Jews gathered around him, saying, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. 
Jesus answered, I did tell you, but you do not believe. The miracles I do in my Father's name speak for me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. Again, the Jews picked up stones to stone him, but Jesus said to them, I have shown you many great miracles from the Father. For which of these do you stone me? We are not stoning you for any of these, replied the Jews, but for blasphemy, because you, a mere man, claim to be God. Jesus answered, answered them, <clears throat> Is it not written in your law, I have said you are gods? If you call them gods to whom the word of God came, and the scripture cannot be broken, what about the one whom the Father set apart as his very own and sent into the world? Why then do you accuse me of blasphemy? Because I said, I am God's son. Do not believe me unless I do what my Father does. But if I do it, even though you do not believe me, believe the miracles that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. Again they tried to seize him, but he escaped their grasp. <clears throat> then Jesus went back across the Jordan to the place where John had been baptizing in the early days. Here he stayed, and many people came to him. They said, though John never performed a miraculous sign, all that John said about this man was true. And in that place, many believed in Jesus. Okay, I am the Father of one. <clears throat> Um, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Back in verse 14, um, the good shepherd and the sheep, um, uh, uh, verse 15, rather, <coughs> just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for the sheep. Um, it, is, it is that we would know him, the he knows the Father. You remember John 17? We'll be, that's, com that's coming up yet in our study. But in, in the prayer, the high priestly prayer, he prays that that they would know that they would know uh, me. That they they would know you, Father, just as I know you, and you know me, and that I and them, and they and me, and together we are one. There's there's an intimacy there which we can only have because of the Son and through the Son, who is perfect, who is who is perfectly human like us and can represent us in every single way, but is also perfect and, and it represents God. It does nothing of his own, nothing on his own, speaks nothing of his own words, does nothing of his own actions, but only what he sees the Father do. He represents God to men, and he represents men to God, and he has no, and he is 100% selfless. He doesn't do anything of his own accord. That's very important in the teaching of John, which may not come out so much in the other synoptic gospels. In the Synoptic Gospels, you see men observing what Jesus is doing and then reacting to it and then learning the lessons about it. But in John, you, John is so much deeper because it has to do with the relationship that we have with God that because of the relationship that Jesus had with God, who is completely not self-conscious, not conscious of himself and of what he was supposed to accomplish and of the result that was going to happen at the other end well I'll get through this now so that later on I can be exalted and be king of kings and lord of lords and every knee can bow but well that 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 even wasn't his 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 goal that's the end but that too is God's work God's the one that highly exalts my job is to humble myself before God and to serve him God's job is to do the exalting and the one he chooses to exalt and that's what Jesus does. He leaves his own future and his own identity to the Father. And his purpose is not to, um, to get what's coming to him. That's, that was Satan's purpose. Christ's purpose was to accomplish what the Father's will was, which, which was to have sons and daughters that, that would be just like him that would be related to him, and that would be in this relationship of intimacy. And in order to do that, he had to give his own life, as a, not just as an example. That's the fault, the fault and the fallacy of religion. Look at Jesus hanging on a cross when you go into the sanctuary. Isn't that a wonderful example? Now go follow that example. And what's the matter with you? He did that for you. 
How come you can't do a little bit better of not living for yourself? And so we, and so guilt, trip, and shame becomes the motivation for people to try to do right and become more religious. It has no power to make a man righteous and to make a man want to do right. But the only power that can do that is, a, is the power of the resurrection because in the resurrection we have new life and a new creation happens and a new mind and a new heart are given to man. And, that, and religion can't do that. Jesus does that. And we, he, he comes to bring men into relationship with the Father. Um, but I, but I, 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 verse 15, right there. I know the Father and the Father knows me. He, God wants us to know him. That word know does, isn't just about knowing how, to, knowing, the, knowing how to recite the theology of what God the Father is, God the Son is, God the Holy Spirit. That, it's not an intellectual knowledge. It's an experiential knowledge. We, you know, I talked about this before when we started this study in the Gospel of John about knowing. It's one of the key words in John's letters and in the Gospel to know. And that, how that gnosko, the, the Greek word for know, is always experiential. It's never, it's never academic or intellectual by itself. That's part of it because we have a brain. And you can't, um, if you can't, you can't explain things without the use of the brain. That, but that's that's not all we are. We're we're a soul. We're where the spirit is where the life of the of the person is. And uh, the knowledge of God is not apart from the brain. And uh, that's also another error. Uh, churches that. Um, in order to know and experience God, you better check your brain in at the door. We're not going to use that here. Um, no, I don't think I want to be in that kind of a church either because then experience runs rampant and it's chaos. And then you, 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 you measure the presence of God by how many uh, signs and miracles there are. And so you know, the devil will be there too. If you want signs and miracles, I'll give you a few of those. You'll get some counterfeit stuff mixed maybe together with some real stuff and people are left wondering what's real and what's not real. You know, you, we're not to check our brain in at the door, but real knowledge of God involves, um, like that, like Shelley Hundley in that testimony, if you're going to show yourself to me, I, you're going to have to, it's going to, it's going to be between me and you. And essentially that's what I heard Frank Majeski say. If you want to know he's real, you're going to have to get to the point where you call on him and you're going to have to say, God, show yourself to me. And you, and if he's real and he's alive, he will show himself to you when you're ready to call out unto him. He's just as alive and real today as he was 2,000 years ago. And he can show himself to you that he's real there if you're ready to call out on him. But that's up to you. And that is between you and him. And when you get to that point where you say, Lord, this is between you and me. If you're real, you're going to have to show yourself to me. And like she said, God picked up that phone call. He answered that call. And he did, he did that for me. He's real. I know he's real. Why? Because I experienced him. And that experience of God is knowledge. That I may know him. Philippians chapter 3. The power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his sufferings. Everything else I come. Books, education. Like the Mark Twain quote. <laughs> Never met the knowledge of God. Never let your... Uh, <laughs> I never, uh, <laughs> I never let my education, or I never let my schooling get in the way of my education. Yeah, so we, 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 we flipped the word education for a degree for so many years and class, so many hours of classroom time and um, never let my uh, schooling get in the way of my education because real knowledge has to do with uh, what, what you really know to be true, that I know that I know. I know that I know God because I've met him and I've experienced him. And uh, you can get that, the, 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 the scriptures and the knowledge of scriptures will lead you there and will point you there. It will allow you to believe the right things about him and about how he can uh, show himself to you and also uh, sift out from the falsehoods that other people are presenting about God and who he is. So it has the power to do that. And the words are life. His words are life and life. So there's power there. 
because if, uh, because they are alive. These words are alive because they are God. He is God. He is the Word and, and fleshed alive. So, um, but I'm stressing. I'm looking at that. The word to know Him and to know Him, you're going to know Him as the Father, and He continually is referring to God as Father and as His Father, and that He wants. I know Him, and He knows me, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father, and I lay down my life. So here's Jesus in between the Father God from whom he came and proceeded and then the people of God here on earth that God set apart to be his own, to know him and to represent him to the rest of the nations. And they don't have this relationship with God as the Father. The problem is, is they're not the willing it's, the problem is, is not just that they're, that they're spiritually dead and severed from God the Father. The problem is, is that they don't know it. You're dead. It's like uh, the person who doesn't know he's asleep is the sleeping dude. When you're awake, you know that you're not sleeping and you know the guy that is sleeping is sleeping. But it's when you're sleeping that you don't know you're sleeping. And that thing that you're dreaming about is real to you. And you don't know it's a dream until you wake up. And this is the way it is with an unregenerate person. He doesn't know he's dead spiritually until he comes into life. And comes in a relationship with the Lord of life. And that and that's what God God wants us to bring the truth and the life to people who are dead spiritually, as Jesus did for us. So he's in order, how do I get the life of the living God communicated to a group of dead people? The answer is it there in verse 15. I lay down my life for the sheep. The only way that you're going to communicate God, the living God, to dead people is that they're going to see somebody who's not, who doesn't have self-interest and they're not, they don't have, their agenda is not their own, but their agenda is from something bigger and someone bigger and greater than themselves. And that's exactly what Jesus was and he did. He came to bring the Father and the Father's agenda to him. So he was very careful. Here's Jesus, the Word of God made flesh. And he doesn't speak a word out of his mouth except the words that the Father gives him to speak. Here's Jesus, the Word of God made flesh. And he doesn't add one letter to the words of God that proceeded from God's mouth or take away. Do not add one word to, do not take away one word from. God's words that he has spoken. This is Jesus, and he was the word. And he's careful not to add to or take away from God's word and God's voice so that they may know him. And, and he lays down and gives his life as a ransom payment for the sins of his. And that's what distinguishes himself from every other teacher of the law or religion that come before him or that will come after him because he came not as a hireling to do his own will on his own power with his own best intentions or his best understanding of the way I'm doing the best you know like we always we always bury people and we say they did the best they could <laughs> you know okay but it wasn't good enough to get to heaven and it wasn't good enough to get me through my childhood either and I'm not condemning the person yes the best they could but God didn't leave us there. The best we could is going to leave us eternally separated from God. God came to give you his best and to offer it to you as a free gift. That's the message of the gospel. And it has the power to give life to everyone that believes. I don't want to, just, I don't want to be satisfied with just my best. Because my best is going to leave me dry, cold, and dark, and lifeless, and dead. And the gospel of Jesus Christ offers God's best, all that he is, life to everyone that will see and believe and know it. And you see him when you see Christ. You see the Father. If you've seen Jesus for all that he is and you take him at his word and look and you're willing to look at him and let his light find you and expose everything that's in you, the right and the wrong, the true, the untrue, 
He'll take the, the garbage and he'll, he'll, he'll expunge that from you and he'll replace it with his light. The only problem is, is how much am I willing to say that I want you more than I want me? And I want what you have to replace what I've filled myself with. That's where we're going. That's, that's, the, that's the rub of men, of reaching men. When are you going to come to the end of yourself? I had to come to the end of myself. Now, I can't do that for somebody else, but I can help bring them along the way by shining light and also telling my testimony. And uh, my testimony is going to do nothing but uh, not tell you <laughs> where I've come because of all the good things I've done to overcome my nasty upbringing and this and that. I didn't do nothing to overcome nothing. I was delivered from the penalty of all of the junk, the, the way that I responded to all the, the garbage that I had dealt in me. I deserve death. And I was taken out of that and given that when I didn't deserve anything but the consequences for my own decisions and my own choices and my own actions. That is the testimony of the blind man who says, I was blinded, now I see. And Jesus is making that. I'm going to try to, I'm going to, try to pictorially... Um, illustrate maybe a little bit this chapter. I can't blame anybody but myself. I, I hung this board, so I should have hung it six inches lower. <laughs> but, um, so, you need something to stand in. Because it looks dark up here. You, you better hope OSHA doesn't see that. <laughs> All right, so I can't um, think of anything more than uh, so here and here's down here, and we'll put our stick figures. Up here, let's do this. This guy's got two arms. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is where we are on the earth. This is all that we see. And then you, you come into the world, all you see is uh, uh, things. You see physical people and you see physical things, right? You have no spiritual knowledge that there's anything beyond what you see and fear other than your emotions and the what you feel. You feel hurt when somebody slaps you. And then when you get older, you feel hurt when somebody insults you. And then later on, you get older yet, and you feel hurt when somebody abuses you. Uh, it takes away your reputation, and it gets, it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. It's more than just a physical slap. But we're in this life and in this world, and there's nothing that gives uh, light to everything around us but the sun. And the sun is a big ball of perfect light, and uh, if you look at it, it's going to blind you. So we're going to say that's kind of like... Um, Spiritually speaking, we can call God that. God is the source of light. Remember John? In John, uh, 1 John, <clears throat> where he says, uh, God is, and, and uh, there were two, two things. Two things that God is, that Christ perfectly exemplified and manifest. Think of it. What does John say in 1 John? God is light. God is light. Those are verses that you, you want to. And that's, um, anybody want to? In that light was the light of all men. Remember the verse? John 1 5. God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. He is light. He's, he doesn't just, he's not like light, he is light. Light is. 100% perfect, absolute truth. You can say, I believe in absolute truth. I believe in that which is truth, by which all, by that absolute, all other statements must come up, will be measured as false or true as they measure up to this standard, which will never change and will never deviate and will never need to be qualified by anything else. It is absolute truth. That is perfect light. God is light. That's John. Jesus. Chapter 8, verse 12, I am the light. A 
of the world. He who comes to me will never walk in darkness. And then John says this, the second thing that he says, God is love. And uh, you've got that in 4.16 and 4.8, I think. God is love. And, and, uh, and he who does not love does not know God, because God is love. you got someone around, uh, you're with around somebody who uh, only does good to you when it benefits them, or if, or if you do good to them, because then you're worthy of, of their good deeds to you. I'm not going to do good to somebody who, who uh, never does good to me, because um, why should I? They don't deserve my goodness back to them. That's not love. That's a person who doesn't have God. If anybody, persons who are keeping score, you can say they're not act, or they're at least not representing God, because God, God never acted in love. John three sixteen didn't happen for those who deserved it. God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have eternal life. And that's all of us. We're all perishing without God, and we weren't seeking Him, but God took the initiative to become man. God is light. God is love. And um, so he's that one source of, from whom all things, the sun comes down into the earth, the son of man. Um, I could do nothing but have another uh, stick figure here. And, uh, and there's going to be this, uh, this thing here, which um, will be the cross because it's through the cross that, that men come to him. And then you have this um, dichotomy this line in the sand, let's say and this is the earth, there, and there's going to be only left two kinds of people on it, those who are related to the Father, and who come to the Father through him. Let's, let's go back to the very first opening passage of John 10. The man who comes in by another, any other way just comes by, uh, but climbs another way, is a thief and a robber, okay, he's a fraud, He's not the real thing, but the man who enters by the gate is the shepherd of his sheep. The watchman opens the gate. That's the, that's the gatekeeper. He opens the gate. The sheep listen to his voice. They know his voice. How do they know his voice? They, they recognize his voice because they're familiar with the voice of the Father. They know the voice of the shepherd because they recognize it. When he's brought out his own, he goes on ahead of them, and his sheep follow him because they know his voice. That's a, that nurse, that word no, gnosko, they know experientially the voice of their shepherd because they have a relationship with him. But they will never follow a stranger. Why? Because when they hear that stranger's voice, I don't know who he is or where he's from, but I know he ain't my shepherd. That's all I, I have to know. So I'm going to put that on. What, if he was from my shepherd and my shepherd sent him, I'm going to, that, uh, I'll know that in time. But I'm going to have to put, I'll, for, for right now, um, you're, I'll, I'm going to have to see a little history here and hear from you to see that whether what comes out of you is the same thing that's coming out of my shepherd and does it bring me closer to the shepherd and is it accomplishing the shepherd's goal, which is to bring me into relationship and to the personal intimate knowledge of the Father. That's how we're to discern where shepherds come from, whether they're legitimate or not, where they come from, who they're representing. This is what Jesus, what Jesus said. Jesus was using the figure of speech of a shepherd because a shepherd, he's not living for his own self. He's not a hireling. In other words, there's nothing in it for him. He represents the owner of the sheep, the owner of the flock. And he remembers praise in John 17, Father, these are thine and I am yours. These are thine. You gave them to me. In other words, they were yours first. You chose them. And I'm taking care of them, and I'm shepherding them on your behalf. But they're not mine. They're yours. And I give them back to you, and I pray for them. And not only for them, but for all those who will believe on me through their testimony and their word. They're all, that they'll all be one as one body and one uh, flock to the shepherd. And so he's the only... He, he not only shows himself as the good shepherd, but he shows himself as exclusively the only one. And that's, that's, that's where the cross comes in, because he lays down his life in sheep. 
You cannot, there is no other way and no other shepherd that will take you into the knowledge of God's presence. Um, okay, and any other shepherd that does pretend to have that um, and, uh, and to discredit the one that uh, God has sent is from the devil. They, came, they come to steal and they come to kill, they come to destroy. I came that they may have life and have it to the full. And um, as a good shepherd, I lay my life down for the sheep. So that is the only, he, he's, 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 laying, he's laying down the only way that a man uh, will come into the flock of God's flock is through um, coming into the pen and, know, and they will know the shepherds from God because they recognize the voice um, through experience, through the knowledge of him. This was given a really a good example. I, I shared this a bunch of years ago too in a message. And this is something I actually read. This, this, was, uh, this was a story of um, um, some uh, Americans who went to Israel. They were um, on tour there and on, on an educational tour and they were learning some things. And this guy with his tour guides brought them to um, a place where these flocks were feeding in the valley with the grass. And, and they watched, it was evening time just before the sun was setting and he, they watched as uh, three different shepherds came into the corral to bring their flocks in for the evening. They bring them into the evening and there's a fence around there to keep wolves away so that the, in the darkness the wolves don't come in and start picking away and feeding on the sheep. Um, so there's a fence there for that, but there's also a gatekeeper who stays awake all night. I imagine they have eight-hour shifts or whatever. <laughs> but they, they, they have gatekeepers there that stay awake so that in case there is a wolf or a predator of any sort that might come in, that he'll be able to, you know, poke them off. And, and that's their job to protect the sheep. So these guys, and this was, this was, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago or so, I read this, it was just a powerful image. They watched as three different shepherds brought their flocks in, and then once the, these three different flocks came in, they all mixed up with each other. So he says, this guy says, I'm, I went to bed, to, I went to the hotel room, and I'm wondering to myself, how, would this, how are the shepherds going to know which sheep is theirs and, and which ones belong to the other, to the other uh, flocks and to the other shepherds. I gotta see this. So he says, he says uh, what time will they be um, coming back for their sheep? So they'll take them back out to pasture and he, they told them what time in the morning they'd be there and they said, I wanna come and see this. I, I, I said, I, I'm like, it's puzzling me how, how they're going to separate which sheep belongs to which owner and which flock. So he comes there the next morning, and um, the first shepherd comes in and stands at the gate, and he's just and he just starts talking out loud. He could have been reading the morning newspaper. It doesn't. It was he wasn't saying anything about anything that meant anything. He's just talking out loud, and the sheep that belonged to him came from out, outside the corral. And they all started heading towards the door because they heard his voice and they recognized his voice. And he looked at them all, and he recognized them all, counted them all, and, and off he was. Then the second guy came up, the second shepherd, same thing. He just starts talking out loud and speaking out loud. And then the sheep that, that were familiar with his voice all started coming towards the gate. He recognized them, and he pulled them out. So and I, he said, what a, what a clear illustration of this passage. Those who know God by experience are going to know when they're hearing his voice. And this is, you're going to know when, if you listen to Jesus and you have this relationship with God, you know where he's from, you're going to know that this man is God and he's speaking from God and he's speaking God's word. You all reject me because you don't know the Father. You need to know the Father. And if you want to know the Father, you can listen to what I have to say. I and the Father are one. He, if you hear my words, how, how do you know that my words are the Father's words? Good, I'm glad you asked. I don't want you to take my word for it. Listen to Moses. 
Listen to Abraham. Listen to Isaiah. Here's what the scriptures say and the Psalms say. See that what I have done and said, believe. If you don't believe me from what I am telling you, believe for the work's sake and for the evidence of scripture's sake. That's what Jesus tells them. But if you don't want to believe and you reject and you have all this evidence, your unbelief is on you. And that's, um, that's where he's drawing the line in the sand. And you are going to find yourself as being on this side of the land, there's a cut, who are going to sit estranged from God the Father because they refuse to accept the Son whom he has sent and they won't listen to the shepherd. And here's the one who, who listens and hears the one who is a good shepherd comes in to, to the Father because he is believing and he's hearing the Father's voice through the Son and he's coming through and on the basis of the finished work of the Son of God. And I want to finish, I know we're all out of time, but I want to um, bring you to this passage in the uh, book of Hebrews chapter 2 and we'll end with this passage here because this is what, this kind of experience perfectly, uh, maybe explains theologically what Jesus is doing. It isn't to angels that he is, this is Hebrews 2, beginning of verse 5. It wasn't to angels that he has subjected the world to come, about which we're speaking. But there is a place where some has testified, what is man that you're mindful of him? The son of man that you care for him. You made him a little lower than the angels. You crowned him with glory and honor. And you put everything under his feet. In putting everything under him, God left nothing that is not subject to him. Yet at present, we don't see everything subject to him. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor. Because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should be made the author of their salvation, should make the author of their salvation perfect through suffering. Both the one who makes men holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. Both the one who makes one who makes men holy, Jesus, and those who are being made holy, the saints are both of the same, we both come from God. We are born because, and we have received God's nature just as Jesus had God's nature fully. Because we, 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 um, we received his nature and ourselves. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers. On the same level of us, he says, I will declare your name to my brothers in the presence of the congregation. I will sing your praises. Here again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children that God has given to me. The true sons of God are those that are from the Father and come back through the Son in perfection back to the Father. And these are sons just like the Son. That's the explanation this. Well, yes, I wish we had more time, but we're out of time. So let's pray real quick, and um, I think we will, we need to have some more discussion on this later. Um, we just don't, we just get about 30, 40 minutes. So, so we'll, pick, we'll pick up on this a little bit more next week, okay? So Father, bless our time this morning. May you inhabit the praises of your people and may our eyes be fixed more on Jesus, who is the author and perfecter of our faith, that we'd be more, um, Lord, um, surrendered to you and just seeing you work out of us the salvation you've given to us and seeing out of us and through us the Son that others would see and know you, God, because of the life of Christ in our lives. We pray that you'd fill us with yourself and make us more like Jesus all through this day and through this week. In your mighty and glorious name, amen. Amen.